Hey, welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. Um, I'm recording on, uh, let's see, it's Monday, uh, April 17th, and um, this is Erev Yom HaShoah, uh, 78 years since the end of the uh, uh, Shoah, the annihilation of European Jewry at the hands of the Germans and uh, their collaborators. And it's notable that uh, this week, uh, JNS reported uh, that uh, PFLP, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a line terrorist organization operating in Berlin called Samidun, uh, held a, uh, a march against uh, Israel and Jews in which 78 years, almost to the day of uh, the, the end of the Holocaust, or at least that's not true, uh, 78 uh, years after the Holocaust ended, um, these um, terrorists aligned with Samidun marched through the streets of Berlin calling jet death to Israel, death to the Jews. So uh, courtesy of Palestinian terrorists, uh, the age-old call for the annihilation of Jewry is again being heard in the streets of Berlin. And while the EU recognizes that the PFLP is a terrorist organization, they've got a problem doing the same for Samidun, which is a, a PFLP front organization. Um, and Samidun uh, branches in Canada have held similar marches uh, in recent weeks and in other countries as well. So this is not just a phenomenon um, limited to Germany. And that really, I think, brings me to the point that I want to talk about in this opening um, that I'm recording on, on Erev Yom uh, You know, um, I don't have, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to talk about the Jews that were killed um, in Europe during World War II, during the Holocaust at the hands of the Nazis. I want to talk about what we mean when we say never again. Because one of the things that we've been seeing over the uh, past several decades is that we were so blinded as a people, maybe as a world, to the unique evil of the German murder machine of, uh, of Jewry in Europe between 1933 and 1945, that we fail to see other uh, aspects that are not unique. Uh, we fail to understand that genocidal Jew hatred is not a unique feature uh, in, in, in human uh, history. Uh, in fact, as we chanted just uh, a week ago uh, at uh, our Passover Seders, in every generation, uh, a nation comes and tries to destroy the Jews, and then God saves us. But the annihilating of the Jews, the chalotenu, to to destroy us, to to swallow us up, to to devour us, is uh, to inflame us, is um, is not a feature that was created by Adolf Hitler and Adolf Eichmann and all of the other Nazis in Germany. Um, it is it is it is something that has accompanied Jews through their history over the past three thousand five hundred years. And um, we allowed the magnitude of what Germany did to blind us to the fact that this is something that we faced in every generation. And in, and in recent decades, in the last 50 or so years, we've seen a new incarnation of this evil, of this concept that it's legitimate to annihilate the Jews. And that legitimization has come in the form of the Palestinian narrative against Israel. Because what we see in Palestinian identity as, as, a, as a distinct group is that it is based entirely on appropriating Jewish history to the Arabs uh, living in the land of Israel and to then transforming the Jews who have been robbed of their history and of their culture, and of their uniqueness, and of their rights, which have been seized by the Arabs of the land of Israel, who call themselves the Palestinians, um, is that they've transformed the Jews into the, 
the anti-Semites. That is, the, the, the new Jews are the Palestinians who have seized Jewish identity for, for themselves, Jewish history, our ties to the land of Israel, our rights to the land of Israel, our history in the land of Israel, and our history as a nation. They've attributed it to themselves. They've transformed us into colonialist interlopers and the villains of our own history, the villains of our own story. And um, and by doing so, they have legitimized the cause of Israel's annihilation. So that whether it's in whether it's in in uh, the streets of Berlin or on the campuses of the major universities in the United States, where death to the Jews is called, I mean, we saw um, people calling for the annihilation of Israel marching through the streets of University of Michigan campus or the the quads of University of Michigan campus. I think it was during the high holy uh, high holy uh, 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 days uh, earlier this year. So 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 we're seeing this phenomenon repeated throughout the Western world, where because of the acceptance of Palestinian appropriation of Jewish identity, we see a legitimization of the cause of the annihilation of the Jewish state and the erasure from polite society, the vanishing from polite society of Jews who are identified or identify with the state of Israel, the Jewish state. Um, and no, this doesn't involve jackboots. This doesn't involve uh, uh, cattle cars and Auschwitz. This is not a reenactment of what we saw 80 years ago in, in Europe, but this is a new um, iteration of the age-old tale of anti-Semitism being uh, characterized by a desire, a willingness to accept the legitimacy of the annihilation of Jews, the annihilation of the Jewish people, the 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 banishing from uh, from the public square of Jews as Jews, um, and the permission the 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 granting of permission for Jews to enter polite society, but not, not as um, Zionists, not as religious Jews, um, not as easily identifiable Jews uh, um, any longer. And uh, we have blinded ourselves to the implication of this, the left in Israel, has embraced this narrative of what lesson we're supposed to learn from the Holocaust that basically says that anybody can be a Nazi, including us. And in fact, uh, Yair Lapid, opposition leader Yair Lapid, said at a, in his remarks at uh, Erev Yom HaShoah uh, ceremony this uh, evening, that uh, the lesson that we take from the Holocaust is that we have to be moral in order, in, in other words, what he's saying, the head of the opposition uh, in in the Knesset is saying that our lesson from the Holocaust is that we're not allowed to be Nazis. But that, of course, is, is obscene. I mean, there's nothing in Jewish history, there's nothing in the behavior of Israel, there's nothing in the behavior of Jews anywhere that would ever lend anybody... Um, a basis uh, for claiming that Jews would ever become Nazis. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that was killed by postmodernism is, is the understanding that nations develop over time and that they have a collective identity that's based on a common history. Um, because uh, postmodern conceptualization of humanity is that we're basically all atoms and that everything's arbitrary and that what happens to me can happen to you. It's all relative. And not only is cultural relativism part of postmodernism, but the but people are taken out of their historical cultural context. And 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 therefore you can't understand the distinctiveness of one nation from another. Why it is that it was the Germans that carried out the Holocaust and not the Russians, not the French, not the British, not the Jews 
not the not not the Americans, etc. There were aspects of German culture that uh, developed and grew over hundreds of years um, that involved an acceptance to the point of an unconscious acceptance of the notion that Jews are subhuman, that Jews are animals, that Jews are beneath the German Volk. Um, and then you add to that the scientific advancement of German society um, and, um, and other aspects of German national character as it developed over hundreds of years of German history. And you get to Wagner and you get to the anti-Semitism leagues and you get to the Green Mo Movement from which uh, the Nazi movement arose. Um, and you see that while well, the Nazis started out as a minority of Germans, and even in 1932, they got less votes apparently than they got in the previous elections, um, their development was not alien to German society. To the contrary, it was organic to German society. And so, you know, you ignore that. And then you can say anybody can be a Nazi. Well, no. Now, can anybody be evil? Sure, anybody can be evil. But the idea that the main lesson that Jews have to take from the Holocaust is that we can't be evil is reducing us to, to nothing, is ignoring then how Jewish culture, tradition, heritage has grown up not over hundreds of years, but over thousands of years. And you atomize Jews to the point that anybody can be anything. I can wake up in the morning and become anything. And obviously you can connect this to all kinds of progressive conceptualizations of um, human agency or lack thereof, depending on whether you have agency to um, be transgender or you have agency uh, uh, to reject transgenderism. Well, no, you can do the former, but you can't do the latter, of course, but that's neither here nor there. But I mean, the idea that, that, um, that Lapid is putting forward is taking away everything that we are, all of the heritage that we've inherited from our parents and our grandparents, and we transfer, we transfer to our children and to our posterity um, and reducing us to just bare bones nothings that can be swayed in any direction. And of course, the, the lesson of the Holocaust really for Jews is that we can't be victims, that we have to be strong. And the difference between where we are today in 2023 and where we were at the ghetto uh, in Warsaw and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising 80 years ago in 1943 is that um, they had the fighting spirit and they had the willingness to sacrifice their lives for their people. Um, and they believed in the uh, rebuilding of the Jewish state, which is why they foisted the blue and white flag with a, with a Magin David, with the Star of David, over the, their bunker on Mila Street in, in the Warsaw Ghetto um, as, as they were as they were fighting the most miraculous fight in Poland, really, of the entire war. I mean, they lasted longer than the Polish army did. Um, but they didn't have the firepower. They didn't have sovereignty. They didn't have tanks. They didn't really even have guns. They didn't have anything. And they weren't free. And the difference between them and the IDF and Israel is that we have a country and that we're strong. And our great challenge, and I'm going to talk about it with my guest, uh, Tony Badran, when we talk, we change gears completely and we move to the issue of what's happening in Lebanon and the onslaught that Israel has been uh, absorbing um, over the past couple of weeks of missile attacks and terrorist attacks from Lebanon emanating, originating, or being you know, uh, in, um, ordered by Iran and the Revolutionary Guard Corps. Kutz Force commander who's been in Lebanon uh, and coordinating with Hezbollah, Hamas, and other terrorist organizations uh, to all attack Israel simultaneously. Um, 
So we're going to talk about that. So Israel's main challenge today is can we stand up to Iran and can are we really going to do something to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear armed regional hegemon or not? And that's the great test that we face today. But the concept that the Jews could be in a situation where we would have this kind of great test facing us, where we would have to ask the question, are we powerful enough to take the action that we need to take in order to secure our place in the region and and our continued existence here um, is something that the men and women fighting in the Warsaw Ghetto 80 years ago would ne- could never even dreamed of, of achieving in their lifetimes. Um, but it was what they saw. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be what they became, which was an inspiration for generations upon generations of Jews in Israel that we hear their war cry, which is Jews be strong. Don't be victims. Don't allow this to happen. Never again means something. But again, we go back to Berlin of this week, where again, there were people marching through the streets of Berlin, just as they're marching through campuses throughout the United States and Europe, calling for the annihilation of the Jewish state. And in Germany, very picturesquely, also called for the death to the Jews. And The confusion of the Jews, the left in Israel, and the liberal Jewish establishment in the United States that simply doesn't recognize that the Palestinian narrative, which they want to accept because they want to believe that peace is possible between Israel and a national movement that defines itself by negating Israel's right to exist, is possible. And when they accepted the two-state narrative, the paradigm of two states, they didn't recognize that what they were actually doing was accepting the blame and the guilt and the responsibility for the absence of peace in the Middle East and accepting the notion that it was Israel's fault because that's sort of the entry point to the Palestinian narrative. Um, And they didn't mean to sign on to the, uh, the whole narrative, which negates Israel's right to exist. It negates Jewish peoplehood and it negates their right, whether as Israeli Jews or as diaspora Jews, to feel any affinity towards their fellow Jews as members of a distinct nation called the Jewish nation. But that's, in fact, what they signed up for. And so they've become very confused because they didn't realize that when they were in in for an inch on supporting the Palestinian narrative against Israel, they were actually in for a mile. And so now we see a situation where Jews who strive for a strong Israel living at peace with its neighbors have suddenly been paralyzed and hamstrung by the Palestinian narrative to the point where not only can't they defend Israel adequately any longer, they can't defend themselves against anti-Semitism, which is literally pushing them out of all the enclaves of American society or British society or French society that they have uh, come over the past several decades, particularly since World War II, to feel most at home. And so, you know, I'm just going to give you some examples. In late February, if you haven't read it yet, you really should look up a very, very important article that was published in Public Magazine by Jacob Savage in late February called The Vanishing. And in The Vanishing, Savage goes through all of the areas of American society that Jews under, um, in previous generations, up until really uh, the 21st centuries, were always most prominent. And now they've, they've simply been blotted out in many cases. And so, for instance, I don't know whether this was his data or, or, or a different article, um, But, you know, in 2000, um, 20 percent of the students in the Ivy League schools were Jews. And today it's only seven and it's going down. Um, You have Jews are almost not not present in New York State's uh, congressional delegation. Um, There used to be 20 Jews in the congressional delegation in New York uh, City Council. Same thing. Jews are being wiped out. I saw an article last week that said that the last Jew, uh, that that the last Jewish professors at City University of New York are being pushed out. And not only are they being pushed out, they're being replaced by anti-Semites. 
um, screenwriters in Hollywood no longer Jewish. Um, academia again, you know, four uh, percent of of ac of top academics under thirty today are Jewish. In the baby boomer generation, twenty one percent were. Um, so, I mean, anywhere you turn, uh, Savage has museum boards. Apparently, Jews used to make up a very large percentage of members of museum boards. Now they're all being pushed out, and they're being pushed out in a wave of anti-Semitism. You saw this at the Whitney Museum, for instance, a member of the Board of Trustees was pushed out because his con his company sells, I don't know, dual-use equipment or military equipment, not quite sure, who cares, uh, to Israel. Um, and this suddenly makes him an animal, and he can't be part of the Whitney Board of Trustees. And and there's, because Jews either are cowards, which I think is probably true in some cases, and in other cases, in many cases, because they've been confused by this two-state narrative, they simply can't understand that what we're facing today, whether here in Israel with Palestinian terrorism, or abroad in this demonization and, and delegitimization of Israel and legitimization of the murder of Jews in Israel um, by the Palestinians and their supporters in the progressive left. It, 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 Jews are being denied their basic civil rights, their basic rights to be members of their own societies. Um, and instead of fighting back against this, um, the, the Jewish leaders in, in, in the United States and in, and in other Western uh, countries are, are making excuses or turning on Israel and ending their association with, is, with the Jews as a nation and instead accepting the atomization of their own identity and saying that being a Jew doesn't mean being part of a nation. I mean, you have, and 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 this isn't going to work. It's not going to work for the individual Jews who are trying to do it. It's not going to work for the Jewish communities in the diaspora, and it's not going to work here in Israel. Um, we we came away from the Holocaust with the slogan of "Never Again," but. I don't think that when this concept of never again was first conceived, that people were deluding themselves into thinking that specifically the horrors, the unique horrors that Jews of Europe suffered as a result of the Nazi machine that, that the German people embraced and then exported throughout Europe uh, and received the collaboration of many, many of the countries that fell under uh, their control. Um, I don't think that the people who, who coined the phrase never again thought that that specific, unique circumstance was liable to repeat itself. I, I think that they probably believed, and certainly today we should understand, that never again doesn't refer only to uh, the Nazi Holocaust, it it refers to Jewish powerlessness and it refers to an acceptance of the notion that there's something inherently, intrinsically wrong with Jews, either as individuals or as a collective, and that standing up for Jews means standing up and against those concepts. And if we don't do these things, either as individuals or as communities or as a country in Israel's case, then it will happen ever again. Again, we'll go back to a situation where not only are people in every generation seeking to annihilate the Jews, but as happened uh, four generations ago, 80 years ago, um, it will happen. It will happen. So. The lesson that I take from the Holocaust and the lesson that I believe that all Jews should take is that the answer to anti-Semitism is not Jewish morality. Jews are moral. 
by and large, obviously we have uh, we have criminals just like any other uh, society and people do. There are good people and there are Bernie Madoffs, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's not the lesson, though, from the Holocaust. The lesson from the Holocaust is to be powerful and to stand up for yourself and to not stand by and accept it when people start denying the rights of the Jews in a way that they do to no other country. Um, so those are my thoughts. And uh, now I want to turn to my interview with uh, Tony Bedran, as I call him, my resident expert on, on Lebanon and the Carolyn Glick Show. Um, and it's changing gears, but I think we're also here going to be talking about, we are talking about uh, an existential threat to Israel and how are we going to handle it? What what are the stakes and, and how how is Israel supposed to be moving forward as Iran grows in power and its proxies uh, in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Gaza, increasingly Judea and Samaria, uh, start taking orders from Tehran uh, to act in coordinated assault against Israel as Iran starts chassing across the uh, nuclear finish line. So uh, without further ado, let's move to uh, that uh, interview. And, and don't forget, uh, Jewish power is good. <laughs> it's very good. And we should seek as much as of, of it as we possibly can, because um, that that's how you fight anti-Semitism. Thank <laughs> you. 